I want to thank you all first off for coming. This meeting was planned uh, well in advance before the release of the biological opinion today. You may be looking around the room and saying, why aren't there hundreds of people here? And that's because we've done things a little differently this time. We've done general membership meetings where we pull out a couple hundred people and we make everybody come to us. This time, we're doing it differently. Our first, our first membership meeting uh, six weeks ago was in Berkeley. Then it was Los Angeles. And then Antioch, Walnut Grove. Today is Stockton. The 13th is in San Jose. Uh, the 15th is going to be in Oakland. Then we're back in Southern California. And what we're doing is we're going to people where they are at and we fill every room. And they may not be the uh, biggest rooms, even though we did pull out, I think, about 80 or 90 people in Antioch. Um, but this seems to be a pretty effective strategy. We seem to be actually getting better attendance doing it this way in smaller subgroups. Because people forget the Delta's five counties. It's four million people. And there are people who have an intense interest in this subject in the Bay Area and throughout the rest of the state. Uh, restore the Delta. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Barbara Berrigan Perea. I'm the executive director of Restore the Delta. We started 11 years ago. A uh, small group of uh, environmental organizations got together and knew that there were a number of processes that were going to be starting around the Delta and possible construction of a new water facility. So uh, they put together an organization. Uh, we had our first meeting at the University of the Pacific 11 years ago with 70 people. We now have 50,000 supporters throughout California. And if you take a look, that is our original logo, except it was in a square uh, the first time around. And you'll see four pictures on there. We are the group that wants to make the Delta fishable, swimmable, drinkable, and farmable. Those are the mandates under the Clean Water Act. So we protect and fight to protect water supply um, in terms of quantity and quality for the Delta. That's our mission, but before I go forward any uh, today, uh, has everyone heard the news today about the biological opinion that came out from the federal government? No. Okay. So there are a list of processes that have to be completed to begin construction of the Delta Tunnels. And people are getting nervous because they're seeing things happen all at once. And I'm going to talk about that push right now by the Brown administration to finish things before he leaves office. We've known that these things were going to happen and that they were coming. We have been fighting the environmental impact report process since 2012. Uh, we are the group with our coalition members um, and that's water rights attorneys here, environmentalists, uh, farm groups that have actually worked through the 85,000 pages of the environmental impact report that go with the Delta Tunnels project. Well, today, um, which was no surprise to us, the uh, Trump administration uh, released a biological opinion that said that they can move forward with construction of the tunnels, that there is no jeopardy to fish. Okay, all right. But before you become completely outraged, um, this is really a move on their part to create buzz. And it's not the complete truth or permitting of the project. The biological opinion that they let out the door today, saying no jeopardy for fish, only <coughs> grants them the ability to begin construction of the Delta Tunnels. It does not give them the right to build the intakes to take the water or figure out how much water they're supposed to get. It doesn't give them access to the water. So what you had created for Buzz today was a scaffold for the water contractors to get ready to uh, push for financing the project, but it doesn't give them the water. And what we think is really interesting is I tell this story today. Metropolitan Water District wanted this. They're cheerleading because they're helping with the governor to push 
to create the momentum to try to sell this to the people who are eventually going to have to sell the bonds for the tunnels. What, um, what they, uh, you didn't see today is you didn't see uh, a report from Westland's Water District that they thought it was such a great deal for them or that it's affordable. We did hear this afternoon that the president of the Kern County Water Agency said that he believes his agency will get a million acre feet of additional water with the Delta Tunnels. And if that's what he believes, then that means that everything that the state has said in front of the state water board for the last six months has been a lie. Because they're saying very little additional water would be taken with the project. So what I'm telling people is this is a long, hard battle. We've been at it for 11 years. And people think, oh my goodness, we're supposed to be coming to the end. And we've worked for years to try to kill it from getting this far. But in many ways, what I'm going to tell you tonight is that the battle is just starting. Because now we're going to go through federal permitting processes. We're going to be finishing at the State Water Resources Control Board. We're going to have another uh, EIR with the Delta Stewardship Council. And it's going to be fight, fight, fight in the court of public opinion and through the courts hard and long uh, along the way. So I'm going to be talking with you about what we need from help from people in this community. And um, I'm just here to tell you all, don't lose heart. We, we have it. Um, I have this strange personality. Every day I get up and I say I'm going to quit. And then they do something, and I get so angry that it's like, well, that emotion passed. Back to fighting. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep fighting. If you don't remember anything else I tell you today, OK, please remember this. The Delta Tunnels, if they are put into operation, will be dry 52% of the time. And that is according to their own environmental impact report. And let me explain what I mean about that. In California, our watersheds that fill the Delta through the Sacramento and the San Joaquin Rivers and the other tributaries the water that's in that system has been overpromised to people on paper five and a half times more than the water that is available in a normal water year. Now, with climate change, you have a whole new set of problems. The water that runs into those water into those rivers, the watershed, is expected, according to USGS, to decline by about 38 percent over the next 40 years. The modeling for the um, environmental impact report and for the uh, case in chief in front of the State Water Resources Control Board to get the permit for the tunnels, the state permit, um, neglects to answer and address those issues adequately. So we're, I'm going to be talking in more detail about that. But you know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. This will help remind you that those tunnels are going to be dry. And who wants to pay $17 billion for dry tunnels? As I go more into the story today, here's the second issue that I want to remind everyone. People think about it being as a loss strictly for Delta farmers. They forget that we have 4 million people who live in the five Delta counties. We have major urban water agencies that are dependent on healthy, clean, adequate Delta water supplies for drinking water. What happens with the Delta is also going to impact groundwater tables and groundwater supplies in the Delta region, particularly for Stockton. And what the state and the federal government has failed to do during this entire process is to do adequate outreach to the environmental justice community. And what I mean by environmental justice, there's a very specific legal de um, definition for who those people are. These are people of color who are living around the poverty level, uh, there's a certain percentage of which you could go over or under. And in some pockets of the Delta here in Stockton, we have zip codes that are 50% environmental justice populations. Uh, this is, makes up a large part of our case in front of the State Water Resources Control Board. They never did adequate outreach to people who speak other languages than English. Um, 
they never went and did adequate outreach to people who maybe don't use uh, mm, traditional media to the extent. They never did notices in newspapers for full community engagement. And, and what's really sad about this, a couple years ago, I was really beating myself up one day. We went to another meeting and I'm looking around and as is often the case, even a little bit in this room, I see a lot of people my age and older. Um, I see a lot of people who, and even though we have a reputation, our staff is very young. We have one of the youngest staffs working in the environmental movement in California. And there weren't a lot of people of color. And I'm like, but wait a second, I know where I live. I know who I see. I know what I see people doing when I go into the Delta. Why is it only these people are participating. And then worse, we read the environmental justice chapter in the environmental impact report, and we pulled the surveys that the state used. And lo and behold, what did we find out? The state winter and interviewed about 50 white business leaders from the Delta over the age of 60. And they called that their environmental justice survey. So, I, at that point, I became very angry, and we really delved into the statistics and the research of how they put this together. Because if you're going to set policy, it's going to change the economics of a community, it's access to clean drinking water, it's access to water to recreate, then it seems that you have to engage the entire population, and they have failed to do it. So our reason for pushing on this is to give voice to everybody in the process. It's not to discount our elderly farmers or middle-aged farmers in the Delta. We love them. They are at the heart of this. But there's a whole community that is tied to it as well that's going to feel the ripple effect. And we want to make sure that everybody has a chance and uh, an opportunity um, to speak about the project. I absolutely love this photo. Um, we hand this out to people. I have groups now that take it in the Bay Area. And the reason why is people in the Delta forget that they're tied to the San Francisco Bay. People in the San Francisco Bay have no idea where the Delta is. But this is the Bay Delta Estuary. The Bay Delta Estuary, fresh water moves through the Delta and it gradually becomes saltier. The X2 line is in this area around Big Break. It becomes saltier. But the nurseries down here in San Francisco Bay, their health is dependent on the freshwater flows that come out of the Delta. This is where we have the nursery for sardines and starry flounder that become halibut. Uh, how many of you like to go to crab feeds? It's like a way of life out here, right? If this water does not move properly through the estuary and keeps this estuary healthy, your crab fishery declines from Monterey all the way through southern Oregon. Okay? The salmon that come out of the Sacramento River Delta are the favorite food of South Puget Sound orcas. They are genetically programmed to eat the fish that come out of the Sacramento River. This estuary is the largest estuary on the west coast of the Americas, and it creates fisheries from south of Monterey all the way to southern Washington. And one of our big beefs about the whole project is that nobody has done an independent economic analysis. The state has failed to do it. They always talk about the value of the water that you export or you take from the Delta to grow all those precious almonds down the I-5. But nobody has done an economic analysis of the value of fresh water to that fishing and tourist economy that runs from Monterey up to Southern Washington. They have failed to do an economic analysis of what clean water means for tourism in the San Francisco Bay. What does it mean for housing, recreation, uh, the right for people to access water, for drinking water for many of these areas, for groundwater supplies? And we believe that if you actually do an economic analysis of all of this put together, it is probably 10 times greater 
than what the value is of applied water to the Westlands Irrigation District or the Kern County Water Agency. This map is just to help remind our river and creek system how it drains. Uh, you know, about half of the state's rivers and creeks actually flow into the delta and out through the San Francisco Bay. It's not wasted water. That's the water that keeps those fisheries alive up and down the coast. This map is a map of the San Joaquin Valley from Tracy down to Bakersfield. And in normal water years, not the drought years, but in normal water years, this is where about 70% of the water that's taken from the delta goes. These purple lands are what we call drainage impaired lands. These are, um, th this land was all once sea. It has what they call corker and clay underneath it all. And when you put applied irrigation water, that means when they grow crops and they irrigate them, the water doesn't drain properly. It's loaded with selenium, boron, bromides, and salt. And instead of kind of percolating uh, in a healthy way, it, it goes through the groundwater table and back into the San Joaquin River. And folks, where does the San Joaquin River flow? Right into Stockton and right in the Delta. So we have this problem. And let me stop. Is everyone familiar? Have you seen the canals that run from Tracy down to Los Angeles when you drive down the I-5? OK. OK. So you have an idea. The, those two canals are for the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project. They carry water from the Delta. The pumps are in Tracy, Byron, near Tracy. Um, so we get it twice. We get way too much water taken out of the Delta, and then we get through the San Joaquin River all the pollution from these drainage impaired lands. The biggest shade of dark purple here, which is land that we are, fight, we are arguing should be retired, is part of the San Luis Delta Mendota Water Authority, with a big chunk of it being the Westlands Water District. And the other problematic area is Stuart Resnick's holdings on the west side of Kern County. That was land that was never farmed 30 years ago, mostly covered now with Palm Wonderful and pistachios. They have no groundwater supply. They're solely dependent on the delta. Okay. Um, I have to say this map is a little dated. The red line here for the Delta Tunnels actually jets further east now, closer to us. We haven't, uh, we haven't had time to update this map, but the reason why I continue to use it is the state maps, as someone remarked last week at the Delta Stewardship Council hearing, show no infrastructure or towns. We think it's really important to show people the towns around the outside perimeter of the Delta, the islands inside the Delta, the gas lines, the PG&E lines, the highways, uh, because there is a couple billion dollars worth of infrastructure in the Delta in addition to the farmland, in addition to the fisheries that is deserving of protection. So the Delta Tunnels project is up here at Hood. They want to put in three intakes. Um, 3,000 cubic feet per second diversion potential. That's 9,000 cubic feet of, per second of water that can be diverted from the Sacramento River, which is our primary freshwater source through the Delta. Uh, the San Joaquin River water that flows into the Delta, we get the tail water off of those big irrigation districts in the San Joaquin Valley. It's highly polluted water. So the problem with the project, in addition to the 14 years of construction impacts, they want to build two, mile, two tunnels 40 feet wide, uh, 35 miles long. They could divert a half um, of the regular flow of the Sacramento River, possibly even more. The tunnels are actually big enough to move 15,000 cubic feet per second of water. They're asking for three intakes. There's nothing to stop them, especially in light of today's bio biological opinion, to come back and say, gee, we need five. They can always add an intake. So that's why we're very suspicious of this. We're going to build it for $17 billion and figure out how much water to take later. So where are we in the process? Um, we have voting happening at key water districts that will, quote, pay for the tunnels. That includes the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. 
They are a wholesale water agency that sells water to municipalities throughout Southern California. The Santa Clara Valley Water District over in Silicon Valley, Westlands Water District, and the Kern County Water Agency. Kern County Water Agency had been out of this game for a couple of years. I'm just fascinated uh, because that's Stuart Resnick's agency that they came back and said today they're going to get a million acre feet of additional water. I, I don't know where from where. Metropolitan Water District is really leading the charge right now with Governor Brown's office. I believe Kern is kind of behind them. Uh, Westlands and Santa Clara Valley are being a bit more thoughtful presently about the process. The Metropolitan Water District vote will be on September 13th, 12th. Uh, Zone 7, which is a small agency in Livermore, will be on the 13th. Santa Clara Valley Water District will be around then. All the water agencies will be taking their vote. No financial plans still. No public discussion of how they will pay for it. We've heard Met say, state water contractors, which Kern is part of, that maybe they could put up money for half of it. We believe it restored the Delta, having looked at the Trump infrastructure list. It does list this as one of the top 100 desirable projects, but there is no public financing for it. So we suspect that it is a project that very likely could be targeted for a public-private partnership because the federal government is not mentioning any type of appropriation for the tunnels. Um, that, oddly enough, uh, probably causes me to lose more sleep than anything else, that that's where the money would come from. In particular, um, when Esperanza and I were at the Metropolitan Water District about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, for their hearing um, on the Bay Delta, San Diego Water Authority, which buys water from Metropolitan, said, well, gee, are we all going to have to put in an equal share of money to pay for the tunnels? Think about it. You've got to pay back big banks in New York. And Met said, oh, no, we're going to do it on water sales. So please tell me if they have to apply for the water every year, which they're going to have to, just like they are now, what happens in the dry years? How do you pay back that water bond? So if we're looking at water sales financing it, and you bring in private partners in a public-private partnership, and I'm going to talk about the uh, Seattle scenario in a little bit, what happens? Who ends up making the payment? Who gets to sell the water? Who owns the water at that point? On one hand, maybe it'll wake Californians up. I can't imagine people anywhere in the state being happy with a scheme to privatize water. But those are the forces that we're very likely going to end up fighting in this project before it's all over. All right. So because it's been a week of sadness for us, uh, many of you were with us at the uh, Delta Stewardship Council last Thursday. Uh, we lost, they moved forward with their amendment uh, to make dual conveyance the preferred alternative. It was language to really put a stamp on Cal Water Fix. It was again done at Metropolitan Water District's urging. We heard that when we were at Metropolitan Water District a month ago. What I think is really interesting, though, is we now have to go through an EIR process. That's an environmental impact report process. That means we have to go for all the scoping meetings. We have to write the comments. And we're going to be doing that at the same time that we're running around trying to stop a vote here. And ta-da, that we're going to begin getting ready for phase two of the State Water Resources Control Board hearing for the permits. The permit hearings, the State Water Resources Control Board is the group that oversees the Clean Water Act in California, how it's implemented, and deals with water rights. So the hearing for the permit to change what we call the point of diversion, let me go backwards. So right now, water's pumped out down here by Clifton Court 4 Bay to send south, and we want fresh water moving through the delta. The permit process of the State Water Board is for what they call a change in point of diversion, meaning the uh, 
water contractors through DWR, Department of Water Resources and the Bureau of Reclamation, are asking for permission to change the point of diversion to here. They have to prove that there will be no legal injury to people who own water rights between here and there. Yeah, let, let, me, let me finish this thought, then I'll answer your question. So we've gone through a technical water rights case. Now what was interesting about this case is it just didn't involve the landowners. We pushed at the water board and we got permission under the human right to water to represent the environmental justice community as water users because they, people in this community would be impacted by higher water rates for treatment, uh, problems with ability to recreate, problems with consuming fish, which will be polluted at a greater level, and uh, basically by being excluded from the process. So that was phase one. We just finished it a couple days ago. Phase two is going to be environment. Um, some of our witnesses in that case will be people from the Windham and Wintu tribe, uh, Lao Empowerment, people who fish here in the Delta for cultural reasons, uh, farm worker groups, people who recreate in the Delta. As they come in contact with water, what will be the impacts on people as well as the fisheries? And there'll be a lot more groups in the second part of this permitting process participating than in the first part because in the second part we have all the big environmental groups weighing in with us. And just for the record, we are represented in front of the State Water Board by uh, Earth Justice. They are, they are our attorneys. Also then, some of you came out and made comments in December uh, about the San Joaquin River flows um, here at the uh, Civic Center. And we were fighting for more flows into the San Joaquin River. We're gonna start that whole process now for the Sacramento River. And that's going to start in the fall as well. So if you, as you can see, we're going to be undergoing one, two, three, four major processes and fighting at four water districts all at the same time. We're gearing up. We, we know what we've got to do. Here's the timeline. Uh, the biological opinion came out today. August, we will get the ruling on how much flow is going to be allowed in the San Joaquin River. We'll start on the Sacramento River. Uh, we're, in September, we're going to be in the EIR process. Um, we're going to be at the State Water Board for part two of the hearings. And we said coming soon, the federal permits for the Delta Tunnels, they wouldn't commit to those dates today on the phone call. So we're kind of waiting to see what's happening. Do we have any questions? I'll stop here for a minute. You had a question, yes? Is it too late to have this tunnel issue put on the next ballot? In okay, so the question is, is it too late to put it on um, a ballot? It's not too late, but there's homework that still has to be done. Um, if you will remember during the Proposition 1 campaign about the last water bond, uh, Governor Brown was able to rally the troops to raise $22 million. We ran an opposition campaign that did get one third of the vote for $80,000. That war chest, a good part of that war chest still sits there. He used some of it when he fought Prop 53, Dino Corda Posse's initiative last year. Um, but you cannot start a battle with a beloved Democratic governor in a blue state unless you do polling that shows that you're at 70%. We have worked for years to get the word out. A lot of people still don't know about the project, and our polling has always been very, very strong. We are in the process of working with people to retest and see where things are because the landscape has shifted since the federal election. Okay? So to answer your question, you don't do a ballot initiative unless you start so high and you've got enough money lined up so you know you can win because if you lose, you could be in big trouble. And so people are doing their homework right now. Okay. No? Okay. All right. So here's what we feel we need from the general public 
and from our members um, really as your participation in helping us stop the project. We need letters to the editor, and I'm not talking about the Stockton record. They actually cover issues really well regarding the Delta. We're very uh, fortunate and blessed and lucky to have Alex Breitler as a reporter. But we um, don't see consistent and fair coverage throughout the state. Uh, a couple of years ago, well we, well, we used to do editorial board meetings. We still do them. But we had no problem uh, talking with reporters or getting an op-ed in uh, the LA Times or the Los Angeles Daily News or the Orange County Register. Uh, the new publishers have very deep ties with Stuart Resnick. Um, we can't get anything published in those newspapers presently. We are told, no, 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 no. You pitch an idea, no. Uh, it's just no right off the bat. No opposition to the governor. Uh, we also know that for a good deal of the press right now, there's a great deal of fatigue. Newspapers have been cut, they have been gutted, they are exhausted. And you know, just because of what's happening at the federal level, there's enough news by 11 o'clock every morning to you know call it quits for the day. So we really need help from Californians telling their media units and their newspapers that look you don't even have to critique the project you just have to tell them this is 17 billion dollars it's going to have an impact on the largest estuary in the americas where's your reporting on it and when you're reporting please just don't tell the state side look at the opposite side there's two sides to this story where's the other side so you can write a letter that is simply a critique of a lack of reporting or a lack of, you know, two sides to a story type of reporting, okay? Now, if you would like to critique the project, uh, you have plenty of handouts today. We have a wonderful website. Most of you who came here know that we are prolific uh, to the point of driving people crazy, okay? You can't, I can't even read everything we put out, okay? So, um, you can go to our website, you can find what interests you, whether it's about fisheries or farming or costs, and you're deputized, cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste, okay? But I'm not gonna sit and tell you how to write your letter, because if I do, it's disingenuous. You know, form letters don't work with newspapers, but you are blessed to cut and paste. Uh, anything we say, you can say. Okay, and you can take what you like, and you can write letters to to uh, newspapers about what you think is wrong with the project. That right now would probably be the biggest help is to help push it up in consciousness and to expect um, true account the press to truly hold the state accountable as to what is happening with the project. And that's fair. And in all fairness to the press, they just need the nudge because they have just too much to cover. I want to say this, staying on top of elected officials and candidates, and I, right now, this is a terrible time to segue, but I have to acknowledge because I forgot. Ann Baird is here representing Assemblymember Susan Eggman. Gary Prost is here representing Congressman McNerney. And Councilmember Christina Fugazi is in the room. I don't think I've missed anybody else, OK? And I don't necessarily mean our local people. Um, you can push them. But for the most part, I can't think of anyone locally who is really in favor of the tunnels, because um, I think we would do a good job of making them nervous wrecks if they were. Our senators, our senators need help and love. From what we understand, Senator Harris is not a fan of the project. She says she's going to protect the Endangered Species Act. But you want to remind her that that's a good decision and you love her for it. Senator Feinstein, as always, is a bit more problematic. Um, <clears throat> she has very close relationships with Stuart Resnick and the growers in Westlands. She's done everything she can to help aid in taking more water out of the Delta. We had that terrible bill in December that was pushed through with her assistance. However, 
because grassroots groups as part of the uh, resistance to federal policy have been so strong in California this year, they approached her at a town hall that was held in San Francisco about two months ago, and her answer was, I am not in favor of the Delta Tuttles. I have not studied it. Now, I would say that's classic political uh, 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 waffling, okay? But that's a really vast improvement. She wasn't about to go out there and say, yeehaw, let's build those tunnels, okay? Um, we kind of have to keep on her. So, um, again, our senators have a lot of other issues to deal with right now. So nudging them, you know, you put in your list of phone calls. I, I get up and seem to have to call somebody every day in my life right now. Um, you know, you can make one of your calls for the week. Oh, yeah, I need to call Senator Feinstein's office and express my opposition to the Delta Tunnels and why. I need to call Senator Harris. So, you know, while you're fighting other things right now, you can just stick in a phone call once a week to those officials. And, you know, maybe uh, when I say, you know, your local officials, nobody's in favor of it, but you need to encourage them maybe to fight a little bit harder, um, to not be afraid. You know, sometimes they get afraid to fight the Brown administration. Uh, not, not people here, okay? But sometimes people get a little f afraid to fight the Brown administration. Back to that problem, how do you fight in a blue state, a beloved Democratic governor um, who has a reputation as an environmentalist, and I'm going to put that in quotes. You got to keep the pressure on. You got to have people get people locally to have heart and uh, be willing to fight. Do you have any questions at this point? There's one in the back. Uh, could you have your website a list of uh, media markets yeah. and maybe newspapers that, that we awesome. could uh, direct our attention to other than locally? Yeah, I mean, we do. We have an extensive media list for all of California, but um, I'll tell you what, if you signed in today, I would prefer not to put that up on my website. I would be happy to email it to people. So, do we have permission to email that to people who are interested? Okay. Okay. Uh, the question was if we could put up a list of newspapers and media markets for which to send letters to newspapers. And what I prefer to do is I'd prefer to email that information to you because I think, too, with each paper, we could uh, probably add a little bit of insight as well. Okay. You had a question, sir? No? No? Okay. Roy? How about TV stations? New York City, their mailing addresses. We just did a whole bunch of postcards for Boots and Boas. How about we could get together and go after it? Al Roker and all of those who see and draw attention that way. Because America doesn't know what we're going through. If you would like to take that on, that would be great. We are covered. I'll sure help. We'd love it. We'll, we'll give you the information. Uh, we do get covered by national press. Uh, but, you know, again, they are all so overwhelmed. Nudging them to pay attention, I think, would be really helpful right now. More questions? About this leader, about Moonbeam. Um, He's not a stupid man. Without hyperbole, why does he really want these tunnels? Because an eight-year-old would see how stupid this is. So, so the question is, why would Governor Brown want the tunnels? Um, this is what I believe. Um, of course, he doesn't really talk with us, OK? Uh, even though we've tried, we have this interesting video where he did come out to talk to me and was more worried about who paid for my signs than listening to what we had to say. I, look, Governor Brown's father started the State Water Project. When they sold the State Water Project to California, it promised water deliveries it could never deliver. Um, Pat Brown wasn't exactly honest about how much the project would cost. That debt is still being paid off to this day. Um, and they need to put water in there. And the tunnels are the way for them to make water transfers easier and faster and take whatever they want out of the watersheds up north. There are so many better ways to manage water in a sustainable way that are economical, which I'm going to get to in a little bit. And, but the one thing that my sustainable management plan that I'll share with you doesn't do is it doesn't make anybody rich. 
So um, part of what's wrong in California is that we have special interest water districts like Metropolitan Water District whose entire business model is made off of how much water you sell. And whether it is your local water system in Stockton or Metropolitan Water District or an irrigation district, we will not survive on that model with climate change. Our water districts will go belly up because you have to have a certain level of expertise in the people who are treating your water. You have to pay them market salaries. You have to rebuild infrastructure. You have to protect that infrastructure. And you cannot pay for that on water sales when there's going to be less and less water to sell. And until somebody has the guts in this state to change and start forcing that we have to change that model, is it that we all pay a flat rate for water infrastructure in California and lifeline rate for low-income people and a penalty for people who use too much water? That's what it's probably going to have to get to. But I have not met one leader in this state who has the courage to take that on. And that's something where I'll, I'm going to get to in a little bit. Okay. Oh, there's a, was there one more question in the back or no? Okay. So here's some interesting food for fodder. Almond production has doubled in the Westlands Water District and Kern County Water Agency since 2000. There are 415,000 acres of permanent crops in Kern County alone. And I think that was last year that we put this up. So I think there's like an additional 50,000 that were planted last year in Kern County. So we're sending our water to a desert where it takes twice as much irrigation water to grow an almond as it does if you grow them in the Sacramento Valley. It makes absolutely no sense. These are Stuart Resnick's products. We strongly suggest not eating them. The first thing I did when we moved into our house in 2009 was plant a pomegranate tree. Um, uh, just because I love pomegranates and oh, and then there's a whole thing halos cuties uh, in addition to using up Delta water uh, they're using fracking waste water to grow those I wouldn't give those to my kids buy your buy your little mandarin oranges from the Sacramento Valley okay. so here are the costs it's 17 billion dollars for the tunnels but once you put in your interest and your operation costs, you're looking at a 50 to $60 billion project. That is before cost overruns. So can you name me one project in California that hasn't come in at about double uh, what was promised? Uh, for 35-mile tunnels, uh, we, we think uh, definitely they're not taking, they only have a 10% contingency based into that $17 billion. It's not enough. Dr. Jeff Michael, he's an independent, uh, independent economist from the University of the Pacific, has said that these cannot be built without a taxpayer subsidy. Uh, again, my worry is it's not a taxpayer subsidy. It's going to be a private partnership subsidy. This picture um, is tied to something that we worked on. If you go to our website, and I think we have copies here today, we did a comparison of the Delta Tunnels to the Seattle Big Dig. The Seattle Big Dig was a about two mile uh, tunneling project that took, I think, four or five years instead of two and came in at $4 billion instead of $2 billion. It was a public private partnership. The JPA, uh, Joint Powers Authority of Public Agencies, partnered with the people who were going to build the tunnels. And what happened was, the state was responsible for doing all the blue marking of the utilities and what was underground. And they came with their big Bertha tunneling machine and they ran into a cement wall. Well, it took them two and a half years to get that tunneling machine back out. And the private contractor who didn't want to have to pay and lose the money because anything that went over budget, according to that public-private partnership, was supposed to be paid for by the construction firms, sued the state. They all had to sit down, they had to renegotiate, and the taxpayers had to cough up the difference. Okay? That is what we fear will be happening. We sent uh, representatives into the International Tunneling Conference on Election Day in Los Angeles, and we actually heard uh, the lead engineer for the project from the Metropolitan Water District 
give a presentation in which he asked international tunneling firms, hey, if I start three machines at the North Delta and three machines at the South Delta, do you think we can meet in the middle? Would you build it this way? That's how they're, that is how far they've gotten in planning for a project that's going to cost $17 billion. Uh, they're asking for free advice from international tunneling firms. It, that doesn't bode real well. It doesn't uh, create a degree of confidence. So, you know, you have big agriculture and who wants the project with the Metropolitan Water District. And they think they're going to take ratepayer money and property tax money from Southern California and Santa Clara Valley to finance some of it, but they're going to have to bring that outside payer and its water sales that are going to pay off the rest of the debt unless we get stuck holding the back. Um, Metropolitan likes to sell the project at $5 per month to their ratepayers. It's really funny um, because they're running a little um, local bond measure in LA County for stormwater, and guess how much they say that costs? $5 a month. Any project you ask them to create in Los Angeles, oh, it's just $5 a month. It's just $5 a month. Well, Dr. Jeff Michael did the analysis on how much the tunnels would really cost, and it's more like $200 per year over 40 years for each household. That's about $9,000. Everybody thinks everyone in LA is rich. Uh, far from that, Esperanza has been working with the environmental justice community down there for a year because people facing higher health care costs, rising college tuitions, housing shortages that make rents and property values go up, rising energy costs, they can't afford $9,000 for no additional water because that water is slated really to go to the agricultural units. Um, there is no increase in supply reliability because the water contractors are going to have to fight it out at the water board with Delta people every year for water. Urban users are going to be subsidizing big ag. That strip of farmland, here's the big myth. You know, they're the ones that say it's jobs, we're the economic powerhouse. These people only contribute three-tenths of a percent of the state's GDP. That's all that comes from these agricultural lands and economic value for the entire state of California. <coughs> all right. Um, so I think I've pretty much explained those points. So let's talk about real local impacts for Stockton and San Joaquin County. We believe the Delta Tunnels really have the potential for being another Flint water crisis. And here's why. In Flint, you had your first problem in Flint was they decided to take away the clean, good Great Lakes water from the people of Flint. And they gave them instead the corroded water in the Flint River. So what did I show you in the beginning? They're going to take away from us the clean, sweet water of the Sacramento River. And we're going to get the polluted water from the San Joaquin River that has unhealthy, according to the EPA, concentrations of bromines, uh, uh, selenium, and boron, and salt. So they take the good water in the tunnels. We get left with the tail drainage water in Stockton. Now, granted, it was a different river problem in Flint. That's as far as I could go. And then you had bad management practices in Flint. And we could talk about that all day. But the Delta tunnels are going to mean more water exports out of the Delta because they're going to have to sell water to pay for the, those tunnels. It's going to be harder to treat water here in Stockton. Our uh, Delta intake system would be significantly impacted. So that means you're going to have to do things to improve water treatment. That means higher water rates. The proponents of Cal Water Fix have not done adequate or thorough groundwater studies on the impacts to our drinking water wells. So it's not just the Delta Intake Project, it's our groundwater supply that would also be impacted. Groundwater for farming, groundwater for drinking water. So as water becomes more toxic in the groundwater and saltier, you have to pay for higher treatment costs there as well. So 
cities like Stockton and Antioch, which have the highest percentage of environmental justice communities, have poorer people who can't afford for those increases. And what you end up with is you end up with a, a loss of access to clean drinking water. So that, those are the parallels to Flint, Michigan. Um, myths and realities. You've heard all the stories. The Delta is uh, a mess. It's going to fall into the uh, ocean. Uh, we're going to be destroyed by earthquake. Our levees are failing. How many major floods did we have during this high water year? Major floods? Orville, I'm talking about the Delta. Zero. We had a levee break up um, uh, Tyler Island in the north end of the Delta. And uh, some of our friends up there, they had a struggle around the clock to save the island and their crops, and their, but they got it done. And we had a levee break down by Manteca by our friends, the Hildebrandts. And we literally had the farmer who stuck his finger in the dike. Uh, they evacuated the area overnight. They fixed it. Okay, I am not here to tell you that our levees are perfect. We have 1,100 miles of levees. We definitely have a good three or 400 miles that need serious upgrades. But it is much cheaper to upgrade those levees, which you're going to have to do because of the infrastructure and because of sea level rise to protect all the people here anyway. The tunnels do not negate that responsibility. The state thinks it does, and they're trying actively every which way at the Delta Stewardship Council to defund investments in our levees and flood protection. So uh, we always love this slide from DWR because if you look at the dates, oh, these are all the historic levee breaks, except for Jones Track, notice they all happened a long time ago, and that's because our farmers got together with the state and the federal government to create a levee subvention program and our levees are in good shape. Are they all perfect? No, but they're nowhere near as bad. The earthquake myth, well, here we go. Earthquakes and climate change. Um, independent geologists like Dr. Bob Pike actually believe that the earthquake threat to California's water system is out, the greatest threat is outside the Delta. San Luis Reservoir in Westlands uh, over by Santa Nella is seismically unsafe and needs major upgrades. Uh, you have uh, everything south of Tehachapi. You have problems with Anderson Dam in the Santa Clara Valley Water District. Uh, they have bigger problems. The thrust fault uh, down by Kalinga actually goes under the canals that transport water. Why would you spend $17 billion on the first 35 miles of that water delivery system and not take care of the rest? Doesn't make sense to us. Um, no Delta levee has ever collapsed in an earthquake, period. We've had problems. That Jones track break was most likely the work of a beaver. But um, they're not earthquake-related problems. The nearest major fault is the Hayward Fault, which is 40 miles away from the west end of the delta. They've had UCLA up here to do tests. They wet the levees, they shook the levees, and they held up pretty well. Uh, no breaks. Levees uh, move in an earthquake, but they don't collapse. They may slump. And again, if you do proper upgrades, because you're going to have to for sea level rise, wide, fat levees, that's the solution. Um, Climate change projections are not included properly in the Kell Water Fix testimony in front of the State Water Board or in front of the EIR, or in front of, or in the EIR. They have hidden the modeling, played with the modeling, won't tell you what the real modeling is, and independent science organizations like the Bay Institute and NRDC contend that Climate change modeling for drought has been greatly underestimated by the state, period. Um, Op-ed on the table that I wrote for the Fresno Bee um, covers all the climate change issues as they are related to the tunnels. Irrigated agriculture in the arid San Joaquin Valley is going to become increasingly imp impractical because it's going to be too hot to grow tree fruit, period. Makes more sense to apply your water and grow crops in the Delta 
where you have those moderating evening temperatures, especially with climate change and in the surrounding areas around the Delta. So let's talk about Stockton specifically. Uh, I have good news and I have uh, troubling news. Let's see, let me do this again, okay. The good news is that the city of Stockton is doing an outstanding job fighting the tunnels at the State Water Resources Control Board, period. They have hired some fantastic attorneys. They've brought in water quality experts to deal with toxic algal blooms, which I have forgotten to mention, but I'll get to. Um, they have worked on the uh, threats to the Delta water intake plant and groundwater supply, and we have worked closely with the city of Stockton. There's, the staff has been responsive. Uh, they've done a great job, and we're pleased as punch with them. Water decisions regarding treatment of the Delta water, so far, so good. This is the big chloramine debate of over a year ago. Um, days of water being unhealthy have decreased with the new treatment methods, and they're handling everything perfectly well. I do worry about future treatment with and without the tunnels because of a decreasing watershed the less fresh water you have, the more pollutants you have in the system, the, higher, the harder it becomes to treat water. And my only concern about our treatment um, methods right now is Kel uh, water doesn't use chloramines. They haven't had to. Um, if they should have to for whatever reason in the future, um, no. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, whatever reason they have to in the future, a good deal of their service area has lead piping. But lead pipes are a whole separate issue for Stockton. Um, I think when Stockton is pushing the federal government for infrastructure money, like every other city in California, they should be pushing to replace lead piping throughout houses and through streets. Um, we know of lead pipe problems in Fresno, Oakland, and Los Angeles. Stockton should not believe it's any different. So we're gonna be working with them and kind of pushing them like, let's get preventive on this one. It's not that anybody's done anything wrong by any means right now and things are safe, okay? And I would say where Stockton needs improvement, but again, this is not a critique for just Stockton. This is the same thing we go and whine at Los Angeles about and San Jose and San Francisco. Our major cities are not planning for a diminishing water supply. The law that was um, passed in 2009 calls for a 20% reduction in water supply by 2020. Not good enough. We're gonna have a 40% reduction in water supply over the next 40 years. We have to do better with groundwater capture, recycling, uh, turf and rebate programs. Uh, we could change out all our own lawns in California. You don't even have to get rid of lawn. You just need to put drought resistant grass in, getting you know, good irrigation systems in. There's a lot of ways to deal with it and it makes a lot of jobs. And this is something that people could do locally. They can talk to city council about really planning for a better future. Let's, you know, Stockton seems to always be gasping to catch up with itself. Um, let's try uh, on water to actually be leaders and let's do better than everyone and show them the way. And s okay, uh, before I get to the solutions, I do want to talk about toxic algal blooms. You know, uh, down by the waterfront, that big smelly green thing that grows? Okay, during the drought, we saw a proliferation of toxic algal bloom blooms throughout the Delta. Uh, people actually got sick from them in uh, Discovery Bay. Uh, a toxic algal bloom contains uh, cyanobacteria that can kill a child, can cause liver failure. We had days in the Delta where drinking water quality did not meet standards prior to treatment, not for Stockton, but in other parts of the Delta um, because of toxic algal blooms, and, and that was at, for water drinking levels that are safe for kids three years old and under. 
Dogs die from exposure to toxic algal blooms. With climate change and less water moving through the system, it's going to become more of a problem. Toxic algal blooms come from flat, still, hot water loaded with nitrates. Okay? So you need aeration, you need turbidity, you need cooler water. Um, the city of Stockton has done an outstanding job bringing in experts to show what these impacts would be to drinking water uh, because they are significant. You cannot treat toxic algal blooms if they enter your drinking water supply. Um, you cannot irrigate with water that comes from toxic algal blooms. It makes the crops toxic. What we don't know is what are the impacts if it gets uh, the bacteria into the groundwater system. Studies have not been done regarding that. It also kills fish and wildlife. So if you see blue-green water out and around the delta, don't touch it. Um, I don't even go particularly close to it because I understand the spores can be airborne and cause uh, upper respiratory problems. Um, you should let officials know if you see them. Uh, but this is one of the things that we want to safeguard, and that's why we want to conserve water so that we keep as much water moving through our water supply as possible with a changing climate. Our case, the city's case, and cases by environmental orgs in front of the state water board uh, contend that toxic algal blooms and experts are agreeing with us uh, will be much worse with operation of the Delta Tunnels. Okay? Now, I, you know, I didn't even think to put one in, but that's a good point. We should probably put a picture up at some point of a toxic algal bloom um, so people can identify them a little bit better. Um, so we have a better solution. If you go to our website, the California Sustainable Water Plan is up there. It was originally part of the Environmental Water Caucus Plan. We have been begging the state for five years to analyze it. They haven't done it. Um, here's what's interesting about um, the state. They keep saying, oh, but we've analyzed a no tunnels alternative and it doesn't work. That's because when they analyzed not building the tunnels, they didn't do any of the stuff we keep telling them to do. Okay? And this is what we are telling people. We have to reduce exports to about three to three and a half million acre feet a year from the Delta. Uh, we export, depending on what's happening, anywhere between four, four and a half million acre feet of water to seven and a half million acre feet of water per year. So if we want the Delta to live, science tells us you cannot divert more than 25% of the fresh water from an estuary and expect it to live. Uh, so, and with climate change, you need more fresh water flows to keep the salt water from intruding back into the delta. Yes. Okay, so that is essential. And if you're gonna have less water moving through the system, it's gonna be important if you're gonna have any fishery, any farming, or you're gonna protect the millions of people who live here, that you have more fresh water moving through the system. We need to see the state activate a much more aggressive statewide regional self-sufficiency plan. Our plan, if you go and look at it online, we, uh, Stina puts out a Wednesday water wisdom, Wednesday water wisdom uh, alert that illustrates a project that has been done somewhere in the state that makes more supply. And it's everything from restoring riparian wetlands up in the Sierra to groundwater cleanup in the San Fernando Valley to um, stormwater capture, uh, tap to toilet programs. It, what's fascinating is that uh, these kind of projects throughout California, uh, studies show create between 12 and 20 jobs per million dollars of public investment spent. The Delta Tunnels, which will be built with foreign construction equipment, only create four to six jobs per million dollars spent. And the jobs that come with water efficiency and conservation and restoration are good paying jobs. They start on average for people without a college degree at about 45000 a year. They're sustainable, they're long term jobs. If we switched out a half a million urinals in LA to become waterless urinals, 
they would gain a million acre feet of water a year. The Los Angeles River sends 11 million gallons of water out to the ocean every day. If they captured that and got it back underground, they could clean up their contaminated groundwater basins and become very close to being self-sufficient. We will probably always have to share some water with Southern California. We're not greedy. That 25% is the goal. That's the number. We could share 25%. Now where it goes in the state, if LA can get really close to self-sufficiency, then sure, more of it could go into the valley. But it makes much more sense to apply water to the $2 trillion economy than it does to an economy that only creates three-tenths of a percent of the state's GDP. So part of our project also, um, those purple lands you saw on the map of the San Joaquin Valley, the dark purple ones, we have a report up on our website by Eco Northwest that shows that it's much cheaper and makes much more sense. You gain a couple million acre feet of water if you retire those drainage impaired lands from agricultural production. It's a very small part of the economy. It's better to retrain farm workers there uh, into new jobs like water technology jobs and to um, uh, free up as much water to keep the healthy areas of agriculture and production. And of course, we've already talked about it makes sense to upgrade levees to the highest standards. And the last one is the water contractors were supposed to pay for the fish screens at the pumps at Tracy over 25 years ago so that fish would not be ground up. They've never done it. They're not going to with the Delta Tunnels. We could re-engineer Clifton Court 4 Bay to make it better. It'll never be perfect, but you can make it better. You can reduce how much water you take out of the Delta. You could spend $17 billion making everyone regionally self-sufficient. It makes more jobs. Uh, it's, better it's better protection for everyone throughout the state in case of earthquake or terrorist attack, okay? And you can upgrade the levees. You put lots of people to work and you end up with many more sustainable ways of managing your water. So I'm tired. It's 7.15. We have the room till 7.30. I can take any more questions if you have any. Yeah, Jack. When we talk about the San Joaquin River as if it actually exists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm wondering, I, I've seen the articles about the legislation that's been proposed. Uh, at the federal level yeah. to defund the restoration. Yeah, of I didn't even get there. So how's all that working out in terms of your plan? Well, they haven't moved anywhere yet with doing that, and that's another problem. I think that's a, another one of those beautiful bills that comes from Valadeo and Devin Nunes. Uh, they want to defund the San Joaquin River um, legislation, restoration, that Feinstein worked on for 25 years to make happen. Um, if that passes, we're in trouble. It's federal intervention into a, a state water right system, uh, but that didn't stop them with the WRPA. Uh, the reason why you've heard me be quiet is that Congress, sorry Gary, but it has nothing to do with you guys. Congress is in such disarray right now that I've been told that I'm my priority of things to worry about by my partners that I can put that one at the bottom of the list for right now. Um, so you can't sweat everything all the time or I'll never sleep. Um, but it is a problem and you are right. I mean, you know, we just started getting water down the San Joaquin River last year. Uh, usually Stockton would receive about a glass full in August or September. So, and, and let me say one other thing about the San Joaquin River, because this was really hard. This county split when the River Flows hearings came up for the San Joaquin River. And um, I have to tell you, if anything almost pushed me out the door, it was this. You cannot recover fisheries if you only put 40% flow into the San Joaquin River. The only thing science tells us is that you can slow down extinction, but you still go extinct. If you put 50% flow into the San Joaquin River to reach the delta unimpaired, you don't go extinct, but you don't recover. You need 60% to recover. 
think about it. Don't you think a, a river, if it's going to maintain itself, should maybe have about 60% of its water? It's kind of logical. But our farmers on the east side, who fought us tooth and nail because they don't want any more water going to the delta, uh, Stockton East, Oakdale, a little further up, they fought tooth and nail because they didn't want to put any more flow in the delta. And our county supervisors caved because, you know, oh, we can't upset, we can't upset everyone, we can't split the county. And even the Delta Water Districts didn't stand up and fight for flow. They stood up and voted for, they, they fought for salinity. The only local group that fought for flow with the people from San Francisco is Restore the Delta. And what is so stupid about it, it gets me so angry, and I'll, probably someone will report this and I'll have a bunch of hate calls tomorrow, is that science also tells us that you have got to at least put about 50% flow in to stop saltwater intrusion going into the east side of the county. So I don't know what these farmers think they're going to farm with. They're all thinking about short-term profit and not long-term sustainability to hand their farm off to their kids and their grandkids. And do you know I had a county supervisor tell me, no farmer plans 25 years out. It's all about what you can make now. Well, uh, not where I grew up in a farming community. Long-term investment is how families built their fortunes. So um, it left a bad taste in my mouth, and we're going to probably see the same thing happen on the Sacramento River. But uh, you know, um, our friends who are concerned about flows will probably litigate if it isn't uh, the right flow to meet other legal requirements. And we got to hope that we keep things at bay um, through federal legislation. I, look, I understand the hardship, I, look, and I don't want to denigrate anything. Farming is hard. In many ways, they are over-regulated about dumb things and not regulated about the important things. There isn't a small business owner who just feels that's all they do is paperwork and that um, regulation in this country is hard. Doesn't mean regulation can't be smarter. But it would seem to me that if you want to use your land to grow crops, you've got to protect your natural resources to be able to keep doing it generation after generation. Yeah. Is it true that the state of Washington and Oregon, they don't want to give California any water? Don't they have a lot of surplus? Okay. First off, if this costs $17 billion for 35 miles, how much do you think a pipe would cost to Seattle? Okay. Second, why would we go about destroying their fishery and their rivers? Because we can't manage ourselves? Yeah, but they have a surplus. We don't. Uh, no, Oregon drought extended all the way up to mid-Oregon and into southern Washington the last five years. Climate change isn't just California, it's the entire West. Yeah. That's right. So, okay. Any other questions? One more. Go ahead, Roy. I'm very willing to try to reach out to TV people if I can get some help. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyone else? There's one more question in the back. Yeah. When they, when they do these, these studies and, and figure out, are they taking into account how the land is growing here in the valley with the water tables depleted? And are they taking into account the fact that there's going to be more earthquake damage because of this depleted water table which absorbs shocks to the earthquake? That's under Sigma in the groundwater supply uh, projects that have begun in California where people have to organize themselves into groups to report how much groundwater they use. We are the only state with that does not do regular reporting and growers fought us tooth and nail on that happening, uh, including my beloved Delta farmers. Nobody wants to do it, but they have to. Um, the real problem with groundwater is, you know, you have subsidence. When you take too much water out, you can't just simply put the water back in, it collapses. 
People think groundwater banking means it's one for one. Oh, I put a gallon in, later I get to take a gallon out. If you do that, you collapse your aquifer. You know, I don't know the exact ratio, but it would be more like let's put four gallons in and later maybe I could take a gallon out. Uh, and that's the other uh, fundamental unjust thing about the Delta Tunnels. San Joaquin Valley has overpumped its groundwater supply. So the tunnels make all these water transfers from the North Coast Rivers easy. And then they're going to force the people in the San Joaquin, in the Sacramento Valley to overpump their own groundwater supply out of the Tuscan Aquifer. And the whole idea that you're going to fix somebody's mismanagement by breaking other communities and forcing them into mismanagement is ridiculous. That's not sustainability. So that's what I can answer for you for that question. Okay, so take literature and uh, we thank you guys for coming and I hope you spread the word and we're gonna be doing a few more of these in the area.